Yeah. What is the right alternative fuel for your fleet? So uh, I am Frank Morris. I am with Clean City Georgia. I'm executive director. Uh, happy to have you here helping me facilitate this session is Commissioner Tim Eccles. Wait, Commissioner Eccles. Commissioner Eccles, why don't you tell everybody how you're broadcasting this? Yeah, thank you, Frank. We are broadcasting on StreamYard today, so we, we are live on Facebook, uh, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn. So uh, it's broadcasting live there, and then we'll sit there and live there. So you can go back and share it with others or whatever if there's something that's helpful for you. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. So uh, I'm going to give my presentation, and then I'm going to be followed by Ian Skelton. He is with Atlanta Gas Light. He's the Director of Natural Gas Vehicle Technology. Great man, Ian. And after Ian is going to be Steve Whaley. He tells you he's the propane guy, but he's with Propane Education and Research Council, PERP. And then Alan Shedd, Director of Emerging Technologies for Global Farm Power. All right. So, gentlemen, for being here. So a little bit about Clean Cities. Who we are? Uh, we are funded by the Department of Energy. Been around since 1993. Clean Cities Georgia was the first uh, coalition chartered by the Department of Energy. This is the Department of Energy's only um, department or group uh, that advocates for the adoption of alternative fuels in transportation, <clears throat> in domestic alternative fuels in transportation, I should say. And uh, it really is focused on reducing petroleum uh, uh, reliance foreign petroleum products uh, for individuals and fleets and transportation. You think about what was going on in the 80s, uh, late 80s, and then they stood this up and we are funded annually, we stood it up in the 90s, we are funded annually from the Department of Energy. And now, I should mention there's a, uh, this is kind of a map of, of all the coalitions. Clean Cities Georgia represents the entire state. Uh, some states have multiple organizations representing them. Notice Florida has Four, and yet they don't cover the entire state. So. Uh, and uh, the Department of Energy has been asking for more funding to grow the Clean Cities program because there's been a lot of success in reducing our dependence on uh, poor uh, petroleum products and even domestic petroleum products. So we are fuel agnostic. Uh, we advocate for natural gas, propane, electricity, hydrogen, biofuels. Uh, renewable fuels. Uh, we also manage grants, and we can be the prime on the grant and the subprime on grants. We've been very successful. We're managing a grant right now, Drive Electric USA. We just finished up a DERA grant, Diesel Emissions Reduction Act grant uh, that uh, ran for 24, 30 months, a little bit longer because of COVID. Uh, some of the things that we work on right now, uh, we were here a month and a half ago talking to um, transportation managers for school districts about the Clean School Bus Program and the money that uh, is being uh, offered under that Clean School Bus Program. Uh, by the way, uh, applications were in, it's closed, and we were told that Georgia has over 60 school districts that apply for over 500 buses. So we, we know we're gonna win some uh, electric school buses contracts with some of these uh, school districts, pretty exciting. We're working on an Electrify America grant. Uh, it's an outreach for, um, again, education and adoption of um, electric vehicles, which kind of goes hands in hand with our Drive Electric Georgia. Uh, we uh, won with uh, other coalitions, this Empower grant, which is gonna focus on workplace charging, really getting started towards the end of this month. And then another project that we're working on to advocate for the adoption of um, EVs. For personal use is E-Ride ATL which is to encourage more uh, drive-for-hire, uh, think Uber, Lyft drivers, um, to um, use EVs um, uh, as their prime uh, vehicle. Um, what is new and what's coming out, a lot of people are paying attention, our phone's been ringing off the hook, is this Vehicle Technology Office, this program-wide FOA that was announced a few weeks ago. Uh, they extended the deadline to September 1st, but it focuses on uh, different uh, alternative fuel technologies, uh, community outreach. There's, there's quite a few lists of things that it's focusing on and will fund. Uh, we have, uh, uh, looks like we might be as a Clean Cities Coalition on about seven different concept papers. Hopefully some of those will be encouraged to go on to apply for uh, additional dollars. We support Commissioner Eccles' Clean Energy Road, Clean Energy Road Show. 
Uh, they had two sessions, uh, one in Cobb and one in Trillis week, last week, and uh, we've got two more coming up. Valdosta, September 14th, and Savannah, uh, September 15th. Uh, we have uh, OEMs and fleets, um, and the municipalities are bringing alternative fuel vehicles, and you get to see and touch those, encouraging more fleets to adopt the technology. There, there's, when someone says, well, you know, we really want to test this, you know, testing's been done when it comes to natural gas, propane, and, and electric in some applications. So it, there's no more about testing, it's either it's do or don't, right? So, um, it's, and that uh, Clean Energy Roadshow kind of highlights that. National Drive Electric Week, uh, we support that as well. That is September 24th through October 2nd. There will be, um, at least that we know of, at least four or five um, um, EV car shows during that week that we will support. And then we have a natural gas and renewable natural gas workshop on October 19th, and you will probably talk a little bit more about that, but we look forward to that and just doing a more deep dive into natural gas um, and RNG as a transportation fuel, and then also as a feedstock for manufacturing. And we are going to do our second uh, first responder training, December 8th. And this one will be focused on EV. So, what happens when an EV is involved in an accident? How do first responders respond to it? You know, which which co color wire don't you cut and can you cut, and so forth. So, very important. So. The IIJA, this Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, it was announced uh, last fall. Um, five, I jumped down to the bottom. Five billion dollars for EV corridor charging infrastructure build out. Uh, each state had to submit their each state's DOT had to submit their plan to the feds. They're in. Feds are looking at them. They have to approve them. Then that tells the state, okay, we like your plan. Move forward. Um, that's going to be over five years. Uh, funding a billion dollars a year. Uh, another funding aspect that kind of gets overlooked right now, we haven't heard a lot about it yet because the, the feds haven't released more information, is this $2.5 billion for, our, for alternative fuels, and that's everything. So that's EV, CNG, hydrogen, LNG, propane um, build-out. And you see the amount of money that it, it escalates over five years, starting out at 300,000, 300 million, excuse me, uh, in uh, 2022 and then up to 700 billion in 2026. So that money can be used for different projects. It's not going, it, it should not go to just one particular energy. A um, little bit more about that, focusing on, on the alternative corridors. If the states build out their corridors, they can then use that money to install charters in different locations, think destinations, parks, community charging and so forth. And then those are some of the entities that can apply for the money. So 29 years of Clean Cities as a national program being up. They didn't just start, you know, they didn't turn the switch and had 70 on in the first year. It's taken time to build up to where they're at. But you can see uh, some of the success successes. And this is what we, uh, when we go, we do once a year call on Washington to get members of Congress to continue to support the program. Here's the return on investment for tax dollars. Coalition projects have helped put more than 1 million alternative fuel vehicles on the road, more than a million. Uh, the National Network of Coalitions is, is helping our energy, our nation's energy and economic security um, efforts yield impressive results. I'm gonna show you some more. Here's another one, 88 million gasoline gallon equivalents were saved through fuel economy, through uh, alternative fuel vehicles. Vehicle miles travel reduction projects avoided over 26 million hours of driving. Coalitions contributed to expansion of alternative fueling stations with over 51,000 different types of fueling stations. You see the fuels there. Um, more than there are more than 75. We're getting close to 100, I believe. Coalitions, ethanol, biodiesel. So here's some facts. You know, this moving to U.S. centric. Energy, ethanol and biodiesel, it originates from U.S. feedstocks. Electric vehicles are powered mostly, almost entirely by domestic fuel sources. Diverse energy options uh, help emergency fleets. If you're, an emergent, if you're a fleet that uses natural gas, and the natural gas is actually pipelined into your distribution yard, you don't have to worry about when there are, are, are fuel shortages necessarily. Now, if a pipeline breaks and it happens to bring natural gas, you might have to worry about that. 
nearly all natural gas and propane uh, in transportation is derived from U.S. sources. Coalition projects have resulted in a cumulative impact in energy use to nearly 12 billion gasoline gallon equivalents, enough to drive the distance to the sun and back 1,540 times. Build nearly 1.49 billion tanker trucks. So pretty good. Uh, the Vehicle Transportation Department uh, awards competitive grants, um, and you can see how the money is leveraged because there, there's typically a skin in the game between the private sector and the funding so that uh, they put some money uh, up towards the, the grant. Um, our coalitions have over 20,000 stakeholders. Uh, here in Georgia, we have about 60 members, and we continue to, uh, to grow, and we look forward to some of you joining because you'll hear about the good work. With that, um, I am the executive director. You can get in touch with me if you just go to Clean City, Georgia. Um, and Sumner Pomeroy, who could be with us, is our project manager. And I'm done. Perfect. Oh, man, look at that. It's just right. a beautiful thing. All right. So next, we're going to hear from Ian Skelton from Atlanta Gas Line. I'll bring up this presentation. <clears throat> Well, with Frank's doing that, um, I just uh, will introduce myself briefly for those that don't know me. Uh, I manage the uh, natural gas vehicle program for Southern Company Gas. Um, most of the work we do is in Georgia. Uh, we've had a, a pretty robust program here since the early 1990s, uh, but we do also uh, three other gas utilities, um, Chattanooga Gas, Virginia Natural Gas, and uh, uh, Nitro Gas. So uh, this is just a, a brief uh, introduction of the value chain. HGL is obviously the gas utility that serves most of the state of Georgia. And uh, we've been building and maintaining CNG stations for our customers starting back in 93 uh, when we created our first customer-facing program, building stations for fleet customers like UPS, Marta, and others. And uh, we have a team of 10 technicians based in Atlanta that do nothing but maintain CNG fueling stations for our customers. So this, this uh, panel is to address you know, which uh, alternative fuel is right for your fleet, depending on your duty cycle, how you use your vehicles. So uh, it's going to be a, a pretty basic 101 on CNG here today. And as Frank mentioned, we're doing a NGV uh, deep dive on October 19th at HGL's uh, Atlanta office. So, um, if you would like a more in depth uh, analysis of CNG, please join us for that. What's the date on that? October 19th. <clears throat> so, uh, CNG, a lot of people, and forgive me that some of this may be pretty basic for some of you, but for those that are not familiar with natural gas vehicles, I think the question I get all the time is well, you know, how many gallons of natural gas to take to, you know, equate a gallon of gasoline, those sort of questions. Uh, so the thing about it in terms of 1.25 therms, is you buy natural gas at your house, you're buying your natural gas by the therm, uh, is roughly 1.25 therms per gasoline gallon equivalent. Um, but if you, depending on um, the jurisdiction, the taxing authority, uh, it could also be 123.57 cubic feet, uh, or 5.66 pounds for the IRS, and for the state of Georgia, uh, they uh, use the 1.25 therms by uh, the directive to multiply the therms by 0.8. So um, the key thing to remember here, though, is that CNG vehicles pay the same motor fuel tax as gasoline vehicles. So you know, all the questions about alternative fuels not paying their share uh, into the highway fund, uh, you know, we, we've been paying uh, uh, motor fuels tax all along. And uh, three types of uh, CNG vehicles, uh, NGVs, uh, dedicated, meaning that you're solely on natural gas, so um, it's 100% natural gas, you're pretty dependent on the fueling infrastructure. Uh, Bi-fuel, so th this is your uh, lighter duty vehicles that um, or gasoline engines that can be set up to run either uh, natural gas or propane or um, gasoline and can switch uh, between the two. 
So there's no range anxiety there. If you run out of CNG, you can keep going on, on uh, gasoline. And then dual fuel, which there's not a whole lot of, of this um, going on right now, but in the heavy duty diesel engines, uh, there is the technology to run a blend of uh, natural gas and, and diesel. Uh, real quick, I'll touch on the uh, tank packages, the advances in, in CNG tank packages. Uh, there's um, not a whole lot of, of new LNG trucks. Early on, uh, it was thought that for heavy duty over the road trucking, you'd have to be running liquefied natural gas in order to get the amount of fuel you need. Um, you can get about twice as much LNG uh, and do the same, twice as many gallons equivalent with LNG in the same size container as you can have seen it. But with all the advances in the tank packages behind the cab, you can get 160, 180 diesel gallons now. Uh, CNG really has has um, become the choice for over the road applications, whereas LNG certainly has a lot of um, opportunities in the off road, uh, marine, rail sectors. And then uh, same with the refuse trucks, new tank packages that uh, really are, are making uh, the CNG trucks very versatile. I'm going to speak through these slides pretty quickly. Um, the, the range of vehicles, you can get pretty much any vehicle you want uh, in CNG. Um, the light duty uh, vehicles are all by and large um, aftermarket conversions by your forward vehicle. Uh, with the gaseous prep engine package having converted to CNG. On the heavy duty side, the, uh, the Cummins engines are the predominant uh, uh, engine that's available, um, and they have engines ranging from 6.7 to 12 liters. The 12 liter engine came out in 2014, and it's large enough to uh, power the Class 8 trucks, the 80,000 pound maximum GVW. Uh, payloads, and if you want more information on all the different engine, uh, truck manufacturers and, and bus manufacturers that offer CNG versions of their vehicles, that's a helpful link there. Uh, the big news in the industry is that Cummins is coming out with 15 liter. There's that gap. You know, if you want to haul double trailers up the Rockies, the 12 liter engine isn't quite large enough, um, and some other applications. So, they're uh, going to be making this available in uh, 2024. Um, this engine is going to be lighter, it's purpose built, uh, natural gas, and uh, already Kenworth and Peterbilt are committed to uh, offering trucks with, with the engine. So, the, the key question is what <coughs> which, um, fleets are ideal for CNG? Uh, it really, it's high volume return to base. Operators. The, the, the higher cost of the fueling infrastructure that is usually required uh, really drives um, the, the best value for uh, fleets that have a fair number of vehicles coming back to a central location where they can spread the fixed cost of that station over a larger volume. The commodity cost, the underlying cost of the energy is, is pretty low. I mean, it's you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 cents a gallon. Uh, depending on what natural gas prices are doing the weather. But you have to have fueling station, cost of that station, maintenance. Um, so if you have a 20, 30 vehicle fleet, comes back to a central location, you've got your project. You've got two or three vehicles, probably not so much. Um, and if you have that right project, then the cost of the gas, the CMG at the pump, um, is the underlying commodity cost is only about 25%, so you can have huge spikes in the cost of natural gas as well. You see a corresponding increase at the pump, whereas with uh, gasoline and diesel, anytime oil prices spike, we see that at the pump. Stations, um, if, if you can use the existing public fueling infrastructure, uh, we have 25 stations in Georgia now, that's ideal. Um, if not, and you're looking at locating a station on your property, there's options there to potentially put a dispenser to the fence, uh, share that station with other fleets in the area, help to spread that fixed cost of the station. Um, time fill versus fast fill, uh, we recommend looking at time fill if your vehicle is going to be parked overnight, like refuse trucks or school buses. 
lots of benefits to do, doing pedal fill. Uh, if not, then fast fill. Um, the schematic, basically with a fast fill station, you do have storage on site. With time to fill, you're compressing the uh, natural gas break in the vehicles. Renewable natural gas is uh, becoming more and more available. 64% um, of all natural gas vehicles in the country last year were fueled with renewable natural gas. It increases your carbon uh, well to wheels reduction from 15, 20% with regular pipeline gas to 80, 90% uh, reduction compared to diesel uh, or even carbon negative, depending on the source of the feedstock. If you're running RNG from uh, dairy in your digesters, you're at negative 380%. So it's uh, the lowest cost um, way to reduce carbon in your fleet applications curve. Uh, here's a map of the public stations in Georgia today. And um, our AGL V52 rate is our primary service offering. If somebody wants to build a CNG station in Georgia, we can come in, fund, build up, and maintain the station for them. So they don't have to get in that business. We recover our costs. And they, it's a simple monthly fixed charge, one and a half percent per month on the gas bill. Here's a picture of the latest station we've developed under that rate, and I'm almost wrapping up. So uh, this is the uh, Marlin CNG station uh, right outside the main gate of the port of Savannah. Uh, just opened in April. Uh, it's the highest capacity CNG station in the southeast. And uh, the uh, station only has two dispensers, but there's enough horsepower there that those trucks won't be at those pumps long. Here's a map of the um, Federal Highway Administration's CNG corridors. As was uh, discussed earlier, the IIJA uh, has $2.5 million of funding that will be coming out. Um, and the CNG uh, corridors, with the exception of I-16 between Macon and Savannah, I think we're well positioned there because uh, the, that dollar is going to go, those dollars are going to go to projects on the, on the corridors. Uh, last slide is just a brief reference to the Alternative Fuels Data Center for more information on CMG. And here's my contact information. Thank you. Sorry, whatever. Any other questions? Yeah, you will not be getting a prize. Most definitely. Tim, you are. Uh, you know, I've been given one job. Yes, okay, so one is, job. Steve's going to give back to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't you start. No, I, I'm, I'm not. A, don't, turn that back off. Okay. 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 Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Right. by the sword. Die by the sword here. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, I'm Steve. I'm the propane guy. So, uh, not, not king of the hill, but <clears throat> not meant to watch that show. I've, I've heard about it, but uh, there he is. No, no, you, you had started. I mean, you would have had to start with, with, with <laughs> your band friend. That counts. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just filling time until Frank gets uh, gets things squared away here. Okay, here we go. Ta da! Okay, Steve, the, Steve, the propane guy. So I'm going to answer the question right up front first. What vehicles work on propane? What's the sweet spot? If you're a baseball player. You know if you hit it off the end of the bat, it's going to go foul ball. Inside, it's going to get a ground out. But that sweet part of the bat, you're going to get a base hit. You're going to get on base and make it happen. Our sweet spot is medium duty vehicles, class three through seven. Okay? And they have to have a duty cycle that uses a lot of fuel. If you're using a class four vehicle and you're in a municipality driving five miles a day, parking and working and driving five miles back, please don't do this. Okay? You're going to spend a ton of money converting something to an alternative that you're not going to get a return on investment. You have to use and displace fuel to clean the environment and also to clean up your budget. Okay, so we're talking about any vehicles that are between 200 and 900. I have postal vehicles now that are 1,100 gallons a month. Okay, and you're doing regional routes. You're driving, you're making. These are the vehicles to replace with propane in that medium duty cycle, class three through seven. Does that mean I can do one, two? Uh, yes, I can. I can't do E's yet. I can't do class eight. So don't even think about propane for class eight. 
Last three groups have medium duty vehicles. School buses, we have 22,000 of them. We've been doing school buses about the same amount of time that the electric folks have, about 11 years. We now have 22,000 of them on the road. And because we've been doing this for 10 years, placement cycles are about 10% per year. We have 100% school districts operating on. It's not a science project, okay? It works, it's financially sustainable, and it makes it environmentally sustainable. So food and beverage is another big industry. And that's the water started with five and a little per you know, publicity stuff. Now they have 1,300 of their water delivery trucks running off of it and won't buy diesel anymore. Schwann says about 2,500 of them nationwide. They were doing it since the 70s. The, my second favorite is paratransit. Not the big shuttle fixed route buses, you know, uh, transit buses, but the smaller point-to-point -point demand response. These vehicles are using about 600 gallons of, of fuel a month. They're taking people to the doctor. They're taking people to the grocery store. They're taking point to point, making it all happen. They have to have wheelchair access, ADA compliant. These vehicles, I have about 7,000 of them in counties all over the United States. Uh, you, you can see how they're, how they're distributed there. Um, now, my favorite one is Paul Strobus down in Brown County, Georgia. He has 300 of these. He documents his savings in fuel every week. And over the last six years, has saved $9.8 million just in fuel costs alone. Coastal. Impressive. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Broward County in Florida, by the way. But that, yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, they're just a little bit south. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> UPS, UPS <laughs> has used propane, DHL, FedEx. My favorite new one is actually it's Postal Service. And if anybody needs help with reducing costs, <laughs> it's a Postal Service. Now, they take care of the first mile, last mile of their own vehicles, but 70,000 of the 92,000 routes are done by independent contractors who own their own trucks, buy their own fuel, okay? And they move the mail between the, the postal services, the offices, the distribution centers, and hubs. In the last year, we've gotten over 121 of these, displacing almost 2 million gallons of diesel, okay? In Denver, the chief sustainability officer, Jennifer, from the Postal Service came out and said, this is a win-win because it's financially sustainable. Now we can be environmentally sustainable, not just in a little way, but in a big way because they're doing their entire fleets moving over to propane. All right, so the reason why it works, this is propane cost, this is everybody else's cost. If you want to know what it is in Georgia, we're about $1.90 a gallon now. Well, now the new 36 cents, now you can take that back off and you're about $1.65. So we don't have death, we don't have knocks, we don't have scrubbers, we don't have any, any of these things that a diesel engine has. And the diesel, uh, or the emission standards that we have today are getting 70% more restrictive in 2024, and even more restrictive in 2027. We already meet this today with our propane. We don't have particular amount of filters. None of that stuff exists on there. And so virtually we're zero on particular amount of filters. The big toxic one is NOx. We're reducing, according to West Virginia, who busted Volkswagen for their Knox scandal. Do you remember those guys? Okay. <laughs> they, what are you laughing at? No, no. They challenged me. I said that propane was cleaner than diesel, a lot cleaner. They said, yeah, right. So both of them checked the box. They both meet the emission standards. They put mobile emission equipment on a brand new propane and a brand new diesel, ran it for two months. Guess how much cleaner that propane bus was than a diesel bus? It's the big blue letters, 96% reduction in those NOx emissions, okay? We'll get to greenhouse gases here in just a second. Current offerings, all the school buses, all of Ford's lineup <clears throat> with that 7.3 liter engine, lots of horsepower. We have aftermarket systems like Ian was talking about for some of the smaller shuttles. We have LKQ. They're the largest distributor of remanufactured parts. You talk about somebody who recycles. They're doing all their vehicles on propane, thousands of them, 8.8 .8 liter. Infrastructure is my favorite part. We can move it around in a bobtail truck. Sorry, we can do temporary fuel. Everybody wants to set up their own station. That's about $40,000 station. They can do 25 buses. Sharp Energy for Nestle can make it all happen. If you go big, you got 100 buses here, all we do is we make a put a bigger cake out there. Same dispensers, 12 gallons a minute. Takes about a closed dryer outlet, a 220, 30 amp circuit to run that pump. It goes 24 hours a day, 12 gallons a minute. Then you get really big where you go down to Texas, because they're big in Texas. Three 30,000 gallon tanks, because you have 800 buses running in the fleet there. But again, the infrastructure cost for moving this propane 
is about $40,000 to the site. You'd be hard pressed to spend more than $100,000 on a propane fueling station if you're doing hundreds of vehicles. And you know what? You'll never spend a dime doing that because every propane marketer who wants to sell you fuel will set it up for free. And they'll take care of it because they want to sell you fuel. They'll lock in a price for about three years, two years if you want, so you know exactly what your fuel cost is going to be for the entire next two years. This is what we showed off in Reno the other day. It's a standalone fueling station. It prompts your propane off the grid. You can put it on top of a mountain, you can put it at the beach, you can put it in the middle of a cornfield. Solar panels charge the batteries that run the dispenser and pump your fuel. Okay, there's also a backup propane generator on there so you can make it all work. Now, they also liked, this is Alejandro Nunez over at uh, uh, EPA's um, uh, mobility. She liked this because this same station now has the EV charger, a level two charger that you can fuel your EV vehicles as well as your propane vehicles off the grid. This thing works 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, even if the lights go out, everything goes out, you can make that work. Then you can go to all the public stations that we have, 2,600 of them all over. Cummins just came out with a brand new propane powered engine. It's again that medium duty 6.7. They like it because the diesel power curve has never been beaten before. And propane did it. We're higher in horsepower and higher in torque and the lowest CO2 of any engine ever made, period. Anyway. Okay, we put it in these vehicles here. Now I can get into some bigger vehicles here. And the future of our propane is renewable, depending on feedstock. You can get really low carbon intensities. The average carbon intensity nationwide for propane is 79. For the electric grid, it's 154. In Vermont, the cleanest state in the union, if I run one of those coastal trucks on EV for 12 months, 200 miles a day, and I run the same one on propane, 12 months, 200 miles a day, I'm 12 tons of CO2 less than the cleanest electric grid in these United States with that renewable propane. We do renewable propane everywhere. Uh, we're about 15% more than a conventional vehicle. Sometimes it's 6%, sometimes about 20%, but they're on average about 15% more than your normal gasoline or diesel vehicle. All of this and more is at propane.com. Got your 51 seconds. Back. Oh my goodness, you do get a prize. <laughs> How much does that hydrogen fueling station cost? Is that cheaper than y'all? <laughs> <laughs> what, that $7 million one? <laughs> I don't want to get you going about hydrogen. You've done so well. Okay. Well, All I right. Wanna, I don't want to cut it this time. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll give him an extra question. Good. Uh, good. Yeah. I'm Alan Shedd with Oglethorpe Power. Oglethorpe Power serves 38 of Georgia's 41 electric cooperatives across the state. We supply electricity and I help answer questions for people. Um, I want to talk about electric, the electric side of this. And I have control over the slides. Oh, yeah. great. Um, I should be forward, but it's not, it's not forward. There you go. I'm forwarding yours, but it's not doing it up here. So, technical issues is counting in my time? No, it does not count in your time. We're going to yield back another uh, 20 right. seconds to you. No. Yeah. If you could see what I was seeing. <laughs> so, I must do, you broke it already. Right. 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 Finger right. buttons right. and such. Right. So, I'll bring this home. Hold on. Hold on. Well, I'll give them a little bit more time and then I'll just wing this. So we'll figure that out. I'm gonna start your time over. You are? Uh, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. We're gonna well, I'm sorry to burn up the, the time we're gonna spend on questions here. What I the reason I want to talk about electric vehicles and the reason for this title about electrification for all is you know, we heard that that LP's sweet spot is is the three to seven class, you know. Compressed natural gas, you know, we can do class eight tractors. In the electric space, most of us think about electric vehicles as light duty vehicles. That's what we see in the press, that's what we hear about. And really, you know, that's important. There are a lot of electric vehicles available in the in the class one, two range. 
you know, but, you know, we tend to think about those as personal vehicles, but the takeaway is there are an awful lot of fleets across the country that use light duty vehicles as part of their fleet. So all the developments, all the expansion of available vehicles on the market, the growth of charging stations also helps you as a fleet operator of one of these light duty vehicles. Well, always has to be some snafu. There are a lot of stats I was going to show you just to impress you. Wow, there it is. Awesome. So, you know, sorry, you've already heard this. Basically, electric vehicles, you know, they, they've been around a long time, over 100 years. You know, Henry Ford's wife drove an electric vehicle, but now things have changed a little bit. We've got cars with better range. We've got more charging stations. There's some cool models available. One in particular, though, that we hear a lot about, particularly in rural places where I work, the F-150 Lightning, is really that game changer. Not only for people who work for a living, need a lot of those features that that truck has, but when you look at it from a light duty fleet perspective, it can fill a lot of important roles there. More electric vehicles on the way. This graph just shows how the landscape of available electric vehicles has changed by 2024, potentially 134 different models available. And a lot of those in the SUV crossover space, in pickups, you know, it's not just compact vehicles anymore. So a lot more choices. Now, the cautionary note here is, yes, that says 134 models will be available. Will all those be available in Georgia to purchase? Probably not. A lot of those vehicles go to the ZEV states, 17 states who have their own sort of side agreements with manufacturers. And if you're in the market for an EV right now, be prepared to wait a while. I ordered mine. Um, it's taken me a month to get it, and I'm paying above MSRP because there's such a demand for vehicles. So production has to keep up, you know, with the demand. Where are they? This is a heat map that just shows where vehicles are located. The national average right now, electric vehicles making up about 6.2% of the market share. You know, no surprise, California, more vehicles out there. If we focus on Georgia, for example, again, no surprises, the metro areas typically have more electric vehicles deployed, but that's changing pretty rapidly. Even rural parts of the state are seeing significant growth in light duty vehicle penetration. Again, I, this is just to give you an idea that when we talk about light duty fleets, we're talking about the potential for a lot of vehicles. These are just a few examples, you know, of the, the sizes of fleets, but think even smaller. Think about cities who operate fleets. Think about police departments. Think about contractors who could benefit from having that light duty electric vehicle that they simply plug in at the office or plug in at home and get all of the the economic savings and maintenance savings as a result of that. To look at heavier duty vehicles, wide range of choices, everything from cool pickup trucks and vans to refuse trucks, fire trucks, you name it, school buses. And for more information on that, I'd encourage you to, uh, there's a, a handout here from EPRI on commercial and industrial on-road vehicles. Happy to give you a link to that uh, so that you can download it and read some more information yourself. Looking at the heavy duty truck sector, lots of vehicles. I mean, this is kind of an eye chart for you guys who chose to sit all the way in the back of the room. I apologize for that. Just if you can't read it, these are big numbers. You know, there are a lot of vehicles out there that have the potential to be electrified. So looking at that market itself, the growth right now is 54% compounded annually. Um, the, the electric truck revenue is forecast to be $15 billion by 2030. Light duty trucks, you know, they're making up a big section of that, of that sale, you know, and, and so the whole thing is booming. A lot of big truck manufacturers getting into the space, names you recognize and trust. A lot of press, you can't hardly open a, a newspaper go online without seeing some announcement about electric fleets, whether it's the Army testing canoe pickups that I have a pre-order reservation on, Walmart, FedEx, 
the clean school bus program that Brent mentioned. That grant just closed out. We're really interested to see how that impacts local schools. And that's just the first 500 million of a $5 billion project that's gonna have a big impact on schools. And of course, you know, larger trucks, class eight trucks, you know, it's an opportunity, but the sweet spot I think is in the smaller trucks, last mile sort of delivery. No surprise, Amazon, FedEx, UPS, those guys really sharpen their pencils and they know where, you know, this makes financial sense. Charger, you know, it wouldn't be fair to talk about vehicles without talking about where you plug them in. So there are lots of charging options depending on whether you're talking about charging at home, you know, with a simple level two charger on the wall, maybe a workplace, public charging. This is a DC fast charging station. I don't know, you know, I'm gonna get points off for not talking into the microphone here. So um, DC fast chargers are designed for, for long trips, corridor charging. If you're driving from Atlanta down here in your electric vehicle, you might need to stop at a DC fast charger for a quick, you know, addition of a few kilowatt hours to get you the rest of the way. Some of these stations can provide as much as 16 miles of driving range for every minute you're plugged in. And that's changing. The vehicle I just ordered, you know, can charge even quicker than that, depending on the available power supply. For home, level two, perfectly adequate. It can add up to about 25 miles of driving range per hour. If your car is plugged in eight hours overnight before you go to work, plenty of time to recharge that car. In commercial fleets, same thing, depending on your application. If you're an over the road truck, this might not be the best application. If you're a you know, fleet operator who has a fixed depot, goes out and back to the same location, plenty of opportunity to charge overnight. We mentioned school buses. School buses typically drive about 40 miles a day, maybe as much as 60 miles a day on a rural route. They can replenish that energy between the morning route and the evening route in the, in the few hours between them. So the vehicle can be fully charged to be able to beat that. Even using a lower power level two charger instead of the added expense of DC fast charger. So lots of opportunities here, lots of flexibility. And it helps that that electricity is readily available right there at that bus barn or at your house. Now, some excitement in the, the big vehicle space, the so-called megawatt charging system. This is a big connector. It's hard to really appreciate how large this is, you know, from looking at it. This thing can supply 4.5 megawatts of power to a vehicle. Now, I'm an electrical guy, I work for an electric utility, that's a big number. That's scary big. You know, the cables have to be liquid cooled because of the heat that builds up in the thing. So it's a it's a challenge, but it's part of a development process, a standards process, and ultimately, you know, to develop charging stations that can support long range um, transportation over the road trucks that can refuel. Uh, with electricity in a, in a short time. Reasons for growth, there are lots of incentives. There are some, some government incentives to make this happen, uh, restrictions on, on environmental issues. Fleet operators, of course, they're really in tune with the total cost of operation and electric vehicles have some unique benefits. It's important just to mention, it's not just about on-road vehicles, some real cool developments in the off-road space, whether it's tractors, recreational vehicles, a jet ski. This is a ferry in Norway, it dates back to 2015. There's an electric airplane that's flying. Um, and forklifts, forklifts have been sort of the classic off-road vehicle forever. And they make good inter, uh, financial sense. So, Tried to rush through it. Thanks so much for having that timer running so I could keep on track. And the real reason for all this rush is so that we can answer your questions. I mean, we can talk all day long, but what's really important is uh, knowing what you guys want to learn about. Yes, I have some prizes. Uh, Steve, um, a webcam cover, a sunscreen bag, or a combustible fork. <laughs> 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 
I'm going to do the sun sunscreen. Okay. I'm going to the beach. Set. Okay. Alan, you get second place. Would you like a wet pan cover or a pan cover? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Much <of> that, man. <laughs> <laughs> Great place. <laughs> Webcam cover and Frank, you did well as well. You get to be aware. Oh, thank you. So, congratulations. <laughs> uh, to the great zones. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I like my idea. What about you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, we have better prizes for the game than the big audience. So, come, come back for that. So, uh, we'll look, questions from our audience today uh, on uh, propane, methane. I mean, even the formula for methane, I mean, that hydrogen formula is so simple, right? Uh, and that methane formula has got all those numbers in it, right? No, it's not. No, the next most simple one is CH4. It's CH4, okay. Propane is a little more Okay, it's propane. Yes. They have eight hydrogen atoms okay. and only three particles. Okay, all right. Well, interesting, doesn't have any particles. Uh, well, wait, wait. Who generally <laughs> 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 My is mine. Um, Steve, I, I mean, the pro, you have been speaking at our community roadshow for many years, and you are, you know, passionately propane. You really are Mr. Propane, the protein guy. I mean, it seems like, Steve, that the way you describe it, it is the perfect fuel. No, no, it's, it's the perfect fuel for the right application, okay? We're not going to be the perfect fuel for every application, but we will be the perfect fuel for that medium duty space that needs to go down the road. And we can do it affordably. If you, if you want to get, let's just pick on school buses just for a second. If you want to displace diesel buses, okay, you want to, there's 480,000 of them out there, but this $5 billion, we're going to replace about, what, 10, 10 or 12,000 of these buses? It's really, it has to be financially sustainable to do it. If you have a $120,000 diesel bus, to do it on propane is $126,000. It's not $375,000, okay? So we can displace a ton of diesel buses, get you 96% of the way there. I just don't see the value proposition is going to do $150,000 for 4% of that. That's just me. Ian, uh, let's go to you. I'm driving my natural gas truck, right? So I've stopped uh, in Covington. Uh, and fill up all the way down. A dollar ninety-five a gallon. That's the best I've seen. Uh, the city of Covington, um, and then I fill up at uh, American Fueling in Cat County with all of those Cat County trash trucks. I fill up there for two forty-three a gallon. Why is there a fluctuation like between Covington and Cat County? Well, what's the what's the difference on that? Well, I can't say for sure. Uh, you know, the, the, their, their pricing models, but um, that's not a big range, big difference. And, uh, you know, there's other things that come into play. There's a 50 cent per gallon uh, federal excise tax credit that some of the retailers may be pricing in and others may might not be, partly because it keeps expiring and we don't know half the time whether it's uh, in effect or not. So um, I would say that's. Uh, Probably not that far, uh, not by the range of uh, price. Frank, let me ask you about municipalities. So I see that thing grow over there, Steve. I'll get back to you. Um, Frank, let me ask you about municipalities that are using um, EVs. I know we've had Al Curtis from Cobb County at the road shows. Are you getting, when you say, um, moderate interest in this, or is it pretty substantial? We're, we're getting moderate interest. Thanks for the question. Uh, we're taking calls and folks are asking, all right, how can I tell if this is going to make sense and what kind of models are out there, municipalities. One uh, call we took was about police departments and they're wanting to change their cruisers, not not the officer cruisers, I guess, but the, the, the management of the police department. They were looking at um, uh, EVs. I, I would like to mention that uh, DeKalb and Tom, both are members of Clean City, so a little bit more familiar with what they're doing with EVs and other alternative fuels. You mentioned the natural gas that to have. But those two municipalities have found ways to use EVs. They park the gas fleet, and uh, in the cab, they use uh, uh, bolts. Uh, they order them with the back seat out, and they put a headache rack in there so they can put tools and parts, and they use them to, dis to displace the pickup truck. And I think, uh, if I remember right, Robert was saying they could even get the passenger seat 
uh, uh, removed as well, so he put something a little bit longer. His point was, why do I have people driving uh, F-150, they never turn it off, they never have a scratch in the bed, um, they run it when they go someplace, they never, you know, they pull up, they do some work, but they never turn it off, and we're a county. It's not, it's not we're statewide, we're not traveling that many miles. And so he's been very successful in doing that. And I know that Bob Curtis does the same thing with having uh, EVs, uh, uh, different applications within the, just the county government. Alan, let me ask you about the rural areas, uh, about EMCs that are you know, either getting uh, F-150 Lightnings, ordering Rivians um, for their members to look at, test drive, I don't know, I think CompUMC has done that. Maybe some more you can tell us. So do you anticipate these trucks being a hit in rural Georgia, or are you seeing them mainly a metro thing? No, without a doubt. You know, there, there are two things that characterize rural America. Yellow school buses and pickup trucks. And we've always said that electric vehicles will reach critical mass in rural Georgia when we get a good pickup truck. You know, so the F-150 Lightning, you know, has, has hit that sweet spot. Uh, it's too bad they're still in short supply. You know, Ford is ramping up production. But yes, but several of our EMCs have ordered them, not only for show, uh, Flint has their CEOs driving one now. Uh, the one at Cobb EMC, they're adding to their fleet to get operational history on how this truck performs. Yeah, Steve, going back to you, you were going to comment. Uh, but you could ask about pricing difference on the CNG. Yes. You had the pricing difference with gasoline and diesel, too. I was just in Tacoma, and you know, I mean, it was $6 a gallon for, I mean, in that. South Carolina, you know, it was $3.29 a gallon. So you have that differential. But the differential is is is, is localized. Kitsap was one of the paratransits that was presenting on the panel with me there. And he had diesel shuttle buses, gasoline shuttle buses, and propane shuttle buses. So you could track all of it. It was 50 cents a gallon on gasoline, 50 cents, 50 cents a mile the travel it is on gasoline. It was 48 cents a mile on diesel, and it was 20 cents a mile on propane. So that puts it in perspective. That's one location, all three of them being operated there. And you can really save a ton of money. If you want to make a difference, we're the, we're the biggest producers of propane in the world here in the United States. We have more of it than anybody. We use about 10 billion gallons of it, and we export 20 billion gallons. How many gallons of diesel do we use every year in transportation? Yeah, I don't know. How many? 40 billion gallons of diesel every year in transportation. Propane can do half of that on Because all we have to do is stop exporting it and use it here. And we can cover half of the diesel usage in transportation. Questions from the audience? Yes, sir. When you're talking about. And you're from the city of Roswell. Just tell us. City of Roswell, Yes. When you're talking about capacity, I don't know. I was thinking about. 4.5 megawatts for a charger. Uh, propane, it sounds like we're doing, we have a lot of capacity. What do you hear and what do you see for generation and distribution if these electric vehicles take off like they are? So we're fortunate in Georgia, we have a, a great electric grid, you know, co owned by the EMC's uh, municipals and, and Georgia Power. You know, we have the capacity in place to do this. Um, so adding that last you know, providing you with the charging you need really isn't the problem. We've got the, the energy supply available. We're working every day to add more of that. You know, there is some build out that will be required to supply high capacity stations like support that 4.5 megawatt station. I mean, that's that's like two Walmart super centers. You know, that's a lot, and that's just for one vehicle. You know, these are all things though that we're good at doing. We're good at building infrastructure. When electricity, you know, first came to rural America, that's what we did. When air conditioning arrived, you know, we beefed up the grid to supply that as well. So, you know, supply of the energy to meet the vehicles is really the, the constraint. And you know, we have Tidy Island in the back, uh, and they recently got a community charging island. I know I have been spending a lot of time down there during the pandemic and was helping the Marine Science Center raise money for their um, sea turtle tank solar thermal and their solar PV pavilion, thanks to the EMCs who really checked in on this, by the way, Alan, $45,000 to help the Marine Science Center. How is, uh, I'm just wondering, are you getting a lot of good feedback about the charger at North Beach? Are you seeing vehicles attached to it? Um, uh, 
We are. I mean, we uh, originally realized that they were concerned whether or not the city was, you know, paying for the electricity probably. We want to know how the parking. So we still charge for parking, and you know, it's a, you know, it's a self pay They didn't key any of their cars or anything on that. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. All right. But it looks it looks great. It, and it, it, we're you know we're kind of interested in you know as far as the city's plea for a little you know curious how it holds up you know the salt water and the salt air and you know if you can get on a four wheel drive or on the beach and have the beach and some of the employees or you know so that would look for us in question. Yeah. Great. I'll have to show you an interesting video separately. There's a guy launching his boat. With a, a Rivian electric vehicle, he drive back to the boat and the truck into the water up to the up to the door sills. Okay. So I chased an electric boat the other day. I'm 75 into the Bucky's. Okay. Uh, this thing was an electric uh, an electric boat. It was a fishing boat. It could be about 35 feet. And I was going, man, this is incredible. I need to get some pictures of it. I pulled into Bucky's and I was talking to the driver. He said, Yeah, this boat's made in Sweden. Uh, and uh, there's 30 of them in the U.S. I'm taking this to a trade show, uh, and I said, you know, how much is it? He said, well, this is called the Tesla of the sea. <laughs> and and 329 thousand dollars for that bad boy. You bought two, right? <laughs> uh, uh, Ian, let me ask you about uh, about things that people don't think about that much, and that is like MARTA buses and, uh, and ports, and I was at you know, the port of LA looking at their top handlers and some of their, I was just sitting there in a vehicle with the port staff, and they were just kind of showing off some of their, their stuff. They had 500 CG drays trucks, they had LNG yard goods. Uh, how significant is volume uh, when you think about a MARTA fleet and, uh, and, and ports and with, with diesel being displaced at that kind of volume? Well, it's uh, very important uh, to have volume, as I, I mentioned in my presentation, you've know, got a fixed cost for infrastructure that has to be offset. And the way to do that is by doing volume and having the right number of vehicles uh, that can utilize that fueling station uh, and, and using a lot of fuel, that's, that's what really drives the, the value proposition. Um, if, you, if you've got the right project, you can get your, your total cost for GTD well under a dollar. And uh, with the 50 cents per gallon excise tax credit, you can get down to 50, 50 cents. A couple of years ago, when that gas prices were way down, there were people basically with that credit that were paying zero per gallon. My goodness. Yeah. So it's all about the volume and good point. Um, you know, the drainage, trucking, uh, other high volume uh, vehicles, lots of vehicles concentrated in one area of ideal progress. Uh, Steve, uh, the first, I guess my first kind of contact with propane, if we were cranking up the roadshow back in 2011, was Groom Transportation out of Virginia. And Chris Groom told me that he was saying, at, you know, at Pun conversion of those E three fifties, which is what he was running at the time, fifteen passengers, a million dollars a year in fuel savings. I think it's more now. He's running, I think, a dual wheel transit or uh, whatever the Ford equivalent of that is now. Do you have other examples of, of vehicles that are just constantly on the road like that, and what kind of savings? Of their experiencing up there, they're negotiating a better price for propane, aren't they? Yeah, and, and like to Ian's point, the more you buy, it, the che cheaper it's going to be. Um, but when some fleets start off with two vehicles, and you know, how, how are you going to do that? And I had two vehicles that were in that pair of transit, they were using 1100 gallons each, so my threshold was about you know 2000 gallons a month to get somebody started with a fuel station for free, um, to, to make it happen and just scale it up. But the ones I think are saving the most are those coastal contractors. Uh, Lisa McAbee takes 38 trips in her box truck every night between Charlotte and Greenville. What, what are these coastal trucks? Most coastal trucks. Uh -huh. They're the uh, independent contractors that move. She uses 1,100 gallons of fuel a month per truck. 
she is saving 70% of her fuel costs. Now, she gets paid per mile to move that van. Now, if she can do it for 70% less, guess what? She's, she's making bank. She said she bought six of these to begin with and bought another 20 and now has another 100 on board. I mean, she can't replace her fleet fast enough to make that happen. And so, Alan, I don't want to get you and Steve into kind of any brawl or anything like that, but um, I mean, you've heard Steve talk about how propane is better than electric, and he gave these numbers using power plant uh, numbers, and I, I can tell you just because I live out in the space that most of the environmental people out there, they... They do, they do like this and go up and then start humming when when someone like Steve says that, because they don't want to really hear that. Um, what? How do you kind of counter that argument and why electric vehicles are really valuable, you know, to the grid, to the environment? I mean, why is it, uh, how would you counter his argument on that? Well, the first, first thing I would do being an engineer, I'd want to see the calculations so I could dig in uh -oh. and yeah. really fully understand you know where where the numbers come from. So yeah, we, yeah, yeah. So we so we the understand in, in, the energy in the Sure, but you know I need to understand a little bit better about how how the numbers are done, what it's based on. You know how that backs up. I mean, there are a lot of studies you can you can read them till the cows come home about well the wheel efficiency of different vehicle types. You know. What's the impact of, of building batteries of all the energy that goes into mining and producing the batteries or, you know, drilling for, for oil and, and delivering it to the, to the vehicle and then ultimately the efficiency of the vehicle. You know, so it is, it is something that, you know, is, is important to take a look at to, to understand what the, what the, all the pieces are that go into that decision process. I think, I think ultimately, when you look at the, the efficiency of the vehicle itself, an electric vehicle is very good at turning energy into motion. Uh, because of, of the simplicity of the vehicle and the inherent efficiency of the electric motor, you know, it's 70% efficient at converting electricity energy into, into motion. It's also interesting that with an electric vehicle, your vehicle gets cleaner over time. When you buy a gasoline vehicle off the showroom, over time, things wear and it starts polluting a little more, things wear out. An electric vehicle, because of the greening of the grid, actually gets cleaner as you drive it. You know, as Georgia moves away from carbon intensive fuels to uh, zero carbon fuels, that electric vehicle you bought today is going to be greener over time. There, there are not many technologies you can point to. Overall, electrification, whether it's talking about vehicles, or high efficiency heat pumps, or any of a dozen things converting your gas power to chainsaw to electric, for example. You know, which I did. This <laughs> always works. Do they make them? I'm out of prizes. Okay, keep going out. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> all those things are, are good. The only way, the most effective way of decarbonizing, you know, the US energy economy is by converting to electricity because of the fuel diversity and efficiency inherent in the system. Now, we may not be quite to Vermont standards yet, um, but we're getting there. Okay, Frank, you want to comment then? I have a question yeah. for you. Yeah, so I would let's go to the lightning round. Then we'll come right my, my comment on that is um, the reason for this panel was to discuss the right fuel for the right application. There is not one fuel that is going to meet every application demand. And so you have to take a look at that. You, you really have to question. Why don't we have more uh, Class A uh, tractors running on natural gas? There, there's, there's plenty of opportunity. It's not new technology. Why don't we have more school buses running on propane? Why don't we have more uh, 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 Class 1, 2, 3, 4 vehicles, electric vehicles? Well, they're not available yet, but why don't we have more people looking at what DeKalb and Cobb are doing? They have found a place for those electric vehicles. They bought them. They're not, they're not testing. They're, they're doing it. So why don't we have more of those applications? And, and I think that's what we have to keep in mind. Um, we should be making this shift. And 
There's plenty of examples of people already doing it. Frank, question for you. Do you drove the Nissan Leaf early on? Um, yeah, I still have it 2013. I'm on my fifth one here. Okay, I'm on my sixth electric vehicle, but that's okay. I've got a prize for myself. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, we let a lot of these used vehicles get out of our state. I mean, if you, if you think about from an equity standpoint or having, um, having people be, be able to afford an electric vehicle, I mean, being able to have bought a Nissan Leaf when it was two years old with 24,000 miles on it for $16,000, that would have been a good deal. But these things wound up going back to Mannheim. They were bought by dealers. They were put on they were they were carriers. They were shipped to Norway. Uh, Norway's up there bragging because they've got all of our used electric vehicles and we've got New York packing them. But I, I learned last night from someone at dinner that California, a certain area of California, this was in Oakland in particular, had offered a, a rebate to people. No, it was their electric company. It was a municipal electric company in Oakland, now we have electric or whatever it's called. Uh, they were offering $1,000 a rebate. I mean, how do we hang on to these used vehicles so that we can help people that can't afford a $50,000 or $80,000 electric car? Uh, I don't know if this is the right answer, but um, we know that in the, uh, it's being called the Inflation Reduction Act, there is a credit that, you know, there's the credit for new vehicles, but now there is a $4,000 credit for someone who buys a used EV with what all what other conditions are around that as well. So maybe that helps. But um oh, that will help. That, yeah, that, that will help. But but uh, to keep, you know, when I turn my leaf in or I buy it, um, you know, how, I don't know, we might have missed the mark on trying to keep those here. So maybe this inflation reduction act helps. Yeah, I like that. Well we have just four minutes left, panel. So uh, is there a question in the audience here for our panel as we as we're wrapping? Uh, yes. I'll, I'll ask a question. Go ahead, Doctor. Uh, so um, we talked about um, natural gas for long haul vehicles and things, and we've seen in the news maybe over the last two years where a southern company has has said that they're going to be testing absorbed natural gas, kind of a new technology. Is that is that what's needed to? Let's go to Ian on that with a mic, please. Uh, the absorbed natural gas technology, uh, we, we are uh, testing two of the F-150 uh, pickup trucks in our fleet with the absorbed natural gas. It's uh, produced by a company uh, named Ingevity, uh, based in Charleston. And or the, their, um, moved to Charlotte, yeah. their efforts around the uh, absorbed natural gas were based in, in Charleston, that's where Bob Manelli decided to retire. But anyway, so uh, that that effort is based on um, a, a carbon absorption uh, monolith uh, in the CNG cylinders that allows you to uh, store the same amount of natural gas in the tank at the uh, at 900 psi pressure instead of 3600. So the real opportunities there are around in re reducing the cost of fuel. So if, if they can move the industry to a, a platform with 900 PSI instead of 3600, there's huge savings in electric usage for compression, maintenance, it makes a home fueling appliance more practical and, and feasible. Uh, we're, we're very interested in, in helping them uh, follow the development of technology. Uh, I don't know where, where it's going to go, but we're, we are obviously very supportive because there's a lot of opportunity there. Anybody else in the audience question for our panel? Um, Steve, just a one quick lightning round question. You mentioned home fueling for propane. Uh, I guess it, there's smaller tanks that you can do not, at home? No, or? No, no. It, it, it's not for that light duty vehicle. Yes. Single home water. They don't use enough fuel to justify the cost of, of making it work. That's a perfect example of, of electric light. I mean, you, you've got a 110 out one theory, you're going to use 220 with a level two. It just fits, it works. You, you got a great ROI. You're not going to get that ROI with home propane fuel. This is a fleet application. And, you know, I mean, yes, I mean, truth be told, I have a propane fueling station at my home, okay? 
But I'm not sure the program guy. Come to the guys. Yeah. 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 Let me look for another promise. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I just want to be real. And why are you using an electric chainsaw? Yeah. Is it fit? It's a it works. You're not going to put your barbecue grill tank up your pocket. No, I mean, so, but yes, I can I can fuel it my own. But just because I can do it doesn't mean I should recommend it and make it financially sustainable. That's, that's tweetable. Somebody, please. <laughs> that's a good, good expression. Uh, Alan, final comment on uh, electrification for uh, EMC or otherwise? What's to say? I mean, everybody has electricity in their house. You know, if you're considering a vehicle, you know, for home use, for personal use, you know, you definitely ought to get the facts with the numbers. If you're looking at it for fleet use, the numbers are there. Your utility can help you make those value decisions to come up with a cost-effective solution. We're not pushing it just for the sake of doing it. We want to make sure it makes sense. Okay, Frank, you get a final word. Um, it's your panel, so there's my one minute. All right. Again, there's a there's right fuel for every application. There's a lot of tools on Fleet City's national website. Take a look at that. Um, we've got experts that can answer your questions and make themselves available. So uh, if, you're, if you're in a position to look at fleet applications for alternative fuels, um, these guys can help you. Thank you. Great. And we're going to give you one minute back. Thank you very much for being in our panel. Thank you guys, too. Thanks so much for being in the alternative fuel panel. Clay, uh, thank you for your question. We're in room one and two here at the Jekyll Island Conference Center. We're going to sign up.